Hi, I'm California Trust Litigation Attorney Scott Grossman, and today I'm going to be discussing the reasons that you can contest a trust in California. Now, the first reason is because there's an improper signature on the trust. Usually when people talk about this, the first thing I will hear is the trust has been forged. And what people are really saying is it doesn't bear the signature of the person who supposedly created the trust. Well, if in fact there is a forged signature, that's true. The trust is then invalid. Related to this is a common misconception that the signature on a trust must be notarized and if the signature is not notarized, then it's invalid. Now that's wrong. California law is absolutely clear on this point. As long as the trust has been signed, that is enough. Notarization is not required on a California trust. The second reason for contesting a trust in California is because the settler lacked the mental capacity to create a trust. Now, California currently has some pretty confusing law on the subject because there are multiple definitions of what constitutes a lack of mental capacity. I'm not going to go through each and every definition, but I am going to give you one of the oldest one because it stayed with us and I think it best encompasses how you know if somebody really is mentally incompetent. There's basically a three-part test to this. The first is, does the person understand the testamentary act? Now, that's legalese meaning, does the person know that in signing a trust, what they're doing is they're creating a document that says who's going to inherit and on what terms after they die? If a person doesn't understand that signing a trust is in fact a quote unquote testamentary act, then they are considered to be mentally incompetent. The second prong of this is whether the person understands the nature and situation of their property. Now, again, that's some legalese. And what it really means in practice is, does the person for the most part understand what they own and their ability to exercise control over it? So you might think of it this way. If a person understands they own their own home and they have a substantial amount of money in the bank or retirement account or a brokerage account, or whatever significant assets they have. And they understand that they have the ability to do as they see fit, meaning they can leave it to their children, they can leave it to charity, they can do whatever they want with this, then they have capacity. If on the other hand, they really don't understand that this is theirs, or they completely misunderstand value, they think a bank account with $100,000 only has $1,000 significant mismatches between what is real and what they believe, then that would be good proof that they lack mental capacity. The third prong to this is whether they understand the nature and relationship they have to various people. And that would include children, grandchildren, spouses, and you can go out along the family tree depending upon the person's particular situation. If a person is unaware that they have children, if they don't understand that they are married, and so they create a trust that doesn't reflect this relationship in any way, that's also good proof that they lack testamentary capacity. In other words, they lack the mental capacity to create a trust. Now, related to this is one other concept. And that is a person may not understand any of this because they have hallucinations or delusions. And what's important if you got this, and this is a specific case, but it does come up from time to time, is that those hallucinations or delusions have to actually mislead them in a way. In other words, they have to create a trust that is terms that the trust would not have had, except that they're suffering from these hallucinations or delusions. The third basis for contesting a trust in California is undue influence. In California, undue influence is defined as excessive persuasion, 
that either causes a person to act or refrain from acting in the way they otherwise would have, but for that excessive persuasion. So what it really means is you have a person who is able to make decisions for themselves, but they don't actually make the decision they want, and that's because there's another person who is over-persuading them to do a certain thing or to not do a certain thing. Now, there's more than one way to prove this, and very frequently this comes up in a situation where a person has some sort of mental impairment like dementia or advanced Parkinson's disease or any number of other ailments that actually affect the person's brain. It also happens where there are very close relationships. And I don't mean simply that there's a family member involved. I mean that whoever it is that's involved has so much pull with the person who's creating the trust that the person who's creating the trust isn't really making up their mind anymore. It's this other person who is determining what those terms will be. There's not a one right way to prove this. There really is a common sense analysis and every case is gonna rise or fall on its own facts. Things that you should look to if you're trying to figure out if undue influence applies to you is how vulnerable the person who's created the trust is, the relationship of anybody who seems to be benefiting from this. So when I say benefiting, I mean somebody who's getting something that's inequitable. If you've got a long existing plan where there was always an equal division between children and now suddenly you've got a plan where only one child inherits and the other two do not, that's the sort of inequity that I'm talking about. You want to look to see if there's some kind of uh, financial relationship or legal relationship. For example, if somebody is already acting under a power of attorney for another individual, so they've got control over their finances, that's another sort of factor that you want to consider here. The fourth reason for contesting a trust is fraud. And fraud in California is pretty much what you think it would be. It means that the person who created the trust was deceived into creating a trust that they wouldn't have if somebody didn't mislead them. So a simple example is a person believes they're signing another document altogether, like maybe a mortgage document, but in fact, they signed a trust. Well, the trust is going to be invalid. The next basis for contesting a trust in California is duress. Duress simply means that either a threat has been made against the person who's gonna create the trust, or threat has been made against that person's property, or they are deceived into believing that either they are personally at risk or their property is at risk. It's very rare, it's very unusual, it's not generally something you wanna to look to in challenging a trust. The last reason for contesting a trust is menace. And menace is just simply the threat of duress. That's it. Those are the reasons for contesting a trust in California. Take a look at the rest of the videos in this series because I'm going to discuss suing the trustee, using the trust as a vehicle for litigation against other people, and the damages that you're entitled to in trust litigation. If you found this video helpful, then please hit the subscribe bell, leave us a comment. We'll be glad to respond if you do, and give us a thumbs up.